So we can start with uh, you, Rob. Tell us about what you do, what your job description is, and the state of play in the House when it comes to AI. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Rob Hicks. I'm the legislative director for Congressman Jay Obernolte from Southern California. He represents the uh, San Bernardino greater county area, if anybody knows the southern portion of the state. Um, I've been with the congressman from, from his first day. Um, this is his second term, so I started with him in 2021. Um, been in the House about 10 years myself, previously working for an Indiana member and a Virginia member. Um, any Hoosiers in the room? I'm from Indiana originally, but none. That's disappointing. Um, uh, as far as the congressman's priorities go on AI, he has a master's degree in artificial intelligence. He got it back in the 90s, so he's well ahead of the curve on all this stuff. Um, a quick story about him, he actually was planning on getting a PhD in it and being in academia doing research on the topic for his career. And um, At the time, his side hustle in the dorm rooms was um, video game programming and that ended up becoming the full-time gig for him. So he ended up with just the masters. And um, so I think that, that experience, I think for him in many ways kind of highlights his attitude towards AI. I think for him, it's an astounding, um, you know, revolution in many ways in the way computing works because it's going, it's going from um, traditional algorithmic computing to probabilistic computing in many ways is what a lot of AIs, yeah, AI is in today's world. And I think for him, it's trying to preserve that entrepreneurialism and just the spirit of seeing what can happen if you let kids figure out what new technologies can do. Yeah, John. I'm John Beezer. I am senior advisor uh, serving on the Consumer Protection Subcommittee staff on the Commerce Committee. <laughs> um, I have, my, my background is primarily in tech startups. I've been here about four years. Um, I happened to meet Senator Cantwell during her five years in the private sector where she got into a dot-com startup, made insane amounts of money, and came back, <laughs> um, which was an interesting experience. Um, and so, again, mostly I've been in tech startups, um, but uh, advising Cantwell on and off informally. And when she took over as, at the time, ranking member of the Commerce Committee, I came out to advise full time. Great. Um, so John, let's start with you. We saw that last year, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer held a series of AI insight forums. Um, those might or might not pick back up this year, but our understanding is that now the work has really gone to the committee level. Um, could you tell us what's next in the Senate Commerce Committee as far as putting legislation together? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, Full disclosure, I don't actually know. <laughs> um, it's been a little crazy. Um, I take the insight forums as a sign that, that Schumer is A, serious, um, and B, that uh, he's been very, very careful to bring Republicans along. So it's it's bipartisan and, and there's a serious commitment. Um, when I initially came out here, uh, my top focus was privacy. Um, that has been an ongoing multi-decade frustration for many of us in the room <laughs> um, and all over the Hill. Uh, and so based on that experience, I, I can't promise you anything's going to happen uh, because <laughs> it just never seems to. Um, but that being said, I think the level of commitment that Schumer has shown and that, that everyone who's gotten involved um, is a good sign. And so I think we will be seeing action all, very soon, probably in a matter of weeks. Um, I've heard rumors about a sort of a position paper that the Schumers are putting together, which may kind of be the starting gun. Um, and I don't know much about it. I don't even know if that's secret, so please don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, so we're looking for some sign that, that the game is on, um, and we'll see. Uh, mostly, though, I would say we're seeing a lot of small bills. Uh, there are a few sort of big consequential ones, but also a lot of very focused smaller ones. Um, I think. It's been stated publicly that our committee is working on a few. Some of the topics we're interested in are uh, deep fakes, um, you know, a, a, a regulatory structure that, that does the job without being, without impeding um, progress, um, competitiveness, bias. I'm probably forgetting one, but those are our priorities. Yeah, and Senator Cantwell had an idea for a GI bill for AI and workforce, if you recall. Could you remind the audience yes. what that was exactly? Thank and you so much. That's the big one that I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what's next with that, if you know? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, 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 th there's kind of a debate about you know whether we should look at huge existential risks or just address what's right in front of us. Um, personally, I kind of lean towards the existential risks because I do think they're credible and I do think we have time to prepare. That being said, I think the most obvious 
challenge that's in front of us is workforce impact. Um, there was a comment made by um, uh, Mustafa Suleiman at Davos this year that basically AI's main function is replacing labor. Um, and I think that's true. <laughs> Um, there's, you know, some arguments that it will create so many new opportunities that there'll be lots of new jobs and everything will be fine, but I, I don't think that's guaranteed and I think we need to be prepared for it. So um, I can't say too much about what's in the AI GI bill. Um, it's, you know, some pretty obvious things like training and, and stuff like that. But I think we're still trying to get a handle on what's actually going to happen. Uh, but I, I think it's probably the clearest, most obvious thing that we need to be working on right now. Then Rob, over in the house, can you touch on what the state of play is there and then specifically get into some of these funding issues? Um, we saw that President Biden signed an executive order that tasks all sorts of agencies with all sorts of new responsibilities um, and multiple have come out and said that they don't necessarily have the resources or the funding for that. Um, can you talk about Congress's role in just funding these agencies and then specifically NAIR? I know your boss is a proponent of the Create AI Act. Sure. So I think you know, the past year has been spent on the House side, especially, I think, in many ways, getting members up to speed. My boss has, frankly, played a decent role in that. And obviously, you know, when you have a member with his degree and background, I think a lot of people just kind of went, Jay, what do I, what, what am I supposed to think? Um, and, you know, and he's, he's a great educator. Um, he's incredibly smart, obviously. And I think from our perspective moving forward, I think there's been, there's a little bit of, you know, the members who are interested are interested and they're going to be part of whatever that process looks like to trying to address AI for the, you know, near term future. Um, you know, other members, you know, they have, they'll, they'll look at AI from their lens of whatever committee they sit on and they'll address it when they need to, but they're not concerned with being, you know, an expert, which is, you know, which is fine. Mem you know, members can't be an expert on everything. Um, you know, as regarding the funding you know, situation surrounding AI. I think that there's obviously going to be a lot of research that is going to need to be done to some, to some degree. Um, and you know, the, the EO, obviously, like you mentioned, stood up the it's the National AI Ch AI Research Resource for those who aren't aware, and it's effectively um, leveraging compute power to allow academia, some, you know, mom and pop businesses, you know, single entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, um, students to just frankly, kind of poke at it and see what they can get. Because I think going back to my boss's days in his dorm room, you know, one of the big things that separates AI from previous computing revolutions is that you need a lot, of, in many ways, massive access to massive amounts of compute to really see what some of the frontier stuff can do. And the federal government, frankly, is one of the largest compute controllers on the planet with all the, um, the, de the labs that the DOE controls and the other science apparatus that, you know, we fund. Um, so the bill, the my boss has a bill, it's called the Create AI Act, which is in many ways basically just um, formalizing and making permanent the pilot program that the um, EO stood up with the NAIR. Um, and so I think in many ways the boss is a big believer in trying to provide access to what this technology can be. So, And obviously there's a longer term um, science funding um, question there of what does this look like and how do we ensure the U.S. is a leader in AI technology moving forward? Um, and that, you know, that's part of the annual appropriations mm -hmm. contest. Yeah, and what's your read on the prospects of these various agencies and efforts actually getting funded? I think, I, I think they certainly will. The question is to what degree. Obviously, we're still trying to work out funding for FY24 before we even move on to FY25 for the coming year. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's a long-term paradigm I think people need to think about too because in many ways the federal government never had to do with computing the way it did 30 years ago and then it's just the paradigm shift of oh yeah we've got to have cybersecurity we've got to have you know like I said earlier DOE has entire supercomputers devoted to their own research like that's just a paradigm shift that I think we'll eventually have to figure out. We had um, Congressman Beyer here earlier uh, noting that there are 191 AI bills circulating in Congress right now and he sees four to five or maybe even 10 getting done. Could I just get your reaction to that? Um, do you see that happening? And how would you prioritize which bills um, should maybe get done first? I think my boss would love to see the Create AI Act move, um, obviously. Um, and, you know, I think trying to put a number on it is, I don't know if it's helpful for the conversation. I think you know, my boss views doing AI, it's not one bill, and it's, it's multiple years, it's multiple bills over multiple years as the issues arise. I think for him, you know, it's like 
kind of the opposite of what the EU has done. They they've have their AI act. I don't know if those who are, who are following it or not. Um, they had this whole big package spun up to address AI, and then they had to halt and rewrite it in many ways because generative AI came online, um, and that you know it was a whole. It wasn't even addressed in the original form of the bill. So I think my boss is concerned that trying to do too much too fast just opens you up to a you're um, locking out potential innovations, and b um, you're not able to react fast enough as things develop. And I think in many ways. For him, you know, he's he's got such the, such a strong tech background that for him, this is just another stage of computing. So I think, um, in many ways, he is definitely one to say, let's let's wait and see to see what real issues arise over time. Uh, John, what's your reaction? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I set out a few months ago to um, create the ultimate AI bill spreadsheet, and my number is eighty five. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> my initial reaction is I, uh, I need better search terms, maybe. Um, I, I, 85 that are introduced and maybe another dozen or so that are being talked about. So, so there's 50 or 60 that I haven't heard number. about. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just want to sort of second on the Create AI Act. That's probably the bill that has got the best prospects. Maybe there's some others I'm not thinking of. But I think, you know, Democrats look at it and see a, some, a way to level the playing field, and I think Republicans look at it and see, you know, there's sort of a danger of market concentration, um, and uh, NARA addresses both of those. So um, I think it's I think it's closest thing to a slam dunk we have. <laughs> um, in terms of you know what we're actually going to do, <clears throat> I think, um, and again, I don't. It, it just seems very dynamic right now, so I don't want to make any definitive predictions, but. Um, what I think would ordinarily happen is there would be some kind of uh, like Christmas tree bill that you stick all the ornaments on. And there may be a few candidates for that, uh, but for various reasons, I'm not entirely sure we have that yet. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking for. That's what I would expect. But I do think everything about this is unusual and, and we could see almost anything happen. And then Rod, there's also a working group in the works. Can you talk about how um, that might be different from the AI caucus and when we might see that uh, being officially launched. So I, I, would, I would say we're, we're waiting. It's the speaker's prerogative at this point. Obviously, it's been something we've been um, looking for with their blessing. And I, you know, I think it's, we're hopeful that something may come soon. But again, that's, that's beyond my pay level. Um, you know, I think, but in terms of what that is versus the AI caucus, I think it's a, the vision my boss has spoken about is it's a little more formalized. I think that will be. Um, in many ways, it'll almost be a cross section of members from different committees, potentially, of where their interests lie. Because I think, you know, kind of what we've been saying, you know, AI is not one thing; it's a it's a tool. If at the end of the day, like it, it doesn't need its own thing. It's when you talk about legislating on AI, it's what does it mean for each specific issue area. Got it. Um, and you mentioned Speaker Johnson; he's he's new. We're also seeing that there's going to be a shakeup on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, Speaker Kathy McMorris Rogers is going to retire. Um, what should the new leader of ENC prioritize when it comes to tech policy, and what direction should the committee take, in your view? Um, well, I think my boss would certainly say, you know, keep keep beating the drum on AI. Obviously, there's you know there's a lot that ENC has jurisdiction over there, and we'd love to see them continue their work in that space. We they had he subcommittee hearings earlier last year. Um, on every topic that they had jurisdiction over. So can just continue beating the drum. Yeah, and in ENC, we've seen that there's been a big focus on the nexus of, of privacy and AI. How do you see that work continuing? Can we expect the ADPPA to be reintroduced this year? Um, that is for the committee to to, to announce when they feel ready. Uh, my boss has obviously been extremely supportive of privacy efforts. Um, he has said that um, you know, he does think we need to preempt state activity on privacy and have a single national data standard. Um, that's obviously something we continue to support in whatever form ADPPA may take up. Yeah. John, what's your read on regulating privacy, you know, this year and where it might go, especially as it relates to AI efforts? Well, this is a 25-minute panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's go back to 2000. Uh, on Senator Cantwell's first campaign, she had two issues. One was universal health care access, and the other was doing something about internet privacy. <laughs> um, and people used to laugh at us and say that, you guys are crazy. You're never going to get health care. <laughs> um, <laughs> only tech audiences laugh at that joke. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so, so obviously it's very, very important to her. Um, it's, um, it's been something I've been focused on. Um, I, I'm, I'm definitely paying close attention, but like everything I seem to say today, I don't have definitive answers, but I can speculate based on what I've seen. Um, there are three scenarios that could play out in the near future. And I think they're equally, <laughs> do I look like I've been working on privacy for years? <laughs> yes. Um, I think they're probably equally probable. So let's just call them 33% odds. One is we do nothing. And the logic on that is that's what we always do. <clears throat> um, the second one is that we go, well, you really, you can't address AI without privacy in some way. So maybe perhaps a limited privacy bill would make sense or, or privacy components within an AI bill. And in particular, I think there's things like training models on sensitive personal data. That should just obviously not be legit, not without um, uh, authorization. Um, so, so I think that needs, things like that need to be addressed immediately. Um, and then there's also the possibility that maybe, um, you know, the, the sort of we meet the moment, that, that AI is so transformative and such a big deal and we're making such a big bill around AI that maybe we just kind of throw privacy in and do comprehensive privacy at the same time. So I wouldn't rule that out. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I wasn't born yesterday, so I don't, I don't expect it to happen, um, but it could. Um, so we'll see how it, how it plays out. And how would you describe the communication and coordination between the Senate and the House on both of these issues, privacy and AI, and how the two might relate at this point? Um, we have been having, the whole time, I've been here four years, we've been having conversations the whole time. So I would describe it as, you know, the conversations ratchet up and they ratchet down, but they never actually stop. Um, and in particular, uh, I guess it's about three and a half years ago, three years ago now, um, follow, it was basically uh, after the Facebook stuff that was sort of huge and really motivated a lot of people. Um, we made a commitment, um, at the time, um, Cantwell was ranking member and Wicker was chair, and we made a commitment to do whatever it would take. And we had very, very constructive uh, discussions that, that were like twice a day for you know an hour or two each, on and on and on for weeks. Um, and we did whittle it down to just a couple sticking points, one of which you mentioned, which is um, preemption and then uh, private right of action being the other one. And there are kind of a few other minor ones, but we got it down to that and we were even discussing ideas that could have been compromises. And then it's kind of like the tide went out. We just didn't quite get there. Um, but that the bill that we worked on eventually did become ADPPA. Um, it had some things in there that we couldn't agree on, and so we didn't support it, unfortunately. Um, uh, but you know, it could all. It, we're much closer than it looks. We've just been working on this a very long time, and it's very hard. And I think we're very close. So anything could happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I would I would say I'm not have been involved with a lot of those discussions. Um, previously but i would say you know committees are still talking and as far as i know and i think from an ai perspective i've had countless staff meetings um house and senate side just staff interested to know more and try and figure out what the technology is about where their boss should be at on it um so i think you know i certainly i certainly feel like i have a lot of the relationships needed got it um in the meantime we're seeing that states are moving forward with their own ai legislation and of course we have the eu ai act how does that impact your work on the Hill? Do you feel increased pressure? Is it informing lawmakers? How would you describe that's impact? Sure, I think it certainly um, gives a sense of urgency to a lot of what we've been thinking about. My boss has said that you know he's he would say he would uh, preempt state activity on AI, and part of his rationale for that is that um, it, you know, like I said earlier, AI as we know it today is fundamentally probabilistic software and ultimately it's based on the data that you're giving it is how it gives you good or bad results, garbage in, garbage out. And one of the things I think it's easy to imagine is you could see where states balkanizing how data gets handled across the country where you, it's some, in some capacity they're requiring affirmative user consent to use their data in some way. And my boss says these systems in many ways are incredibly valuable when they can ingest an enormous amount of data. And if you're turning off the spigot, so to speak, on that, you're limiting the potential for the benefits they're gonna to bring to society. And I think in many ways, this is an industrial revolution of a new sort that we haven't seen yet. And I think my boss is really concerned that if you're fracturing the ecosystem of where AI can be used and how you can use the data needed for it, you're limiting the benefits that everybody can eventually have. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to disagree. <laughs> um, but I also want to make it clear that this is a personal opinion. 
Um, when I say we're close, we are very close. So if I express a strong opinion on preemption, that is my personal opinion, not the committee. Um, so I, I think it's a good thing that the states are putting their own laws together. Um, and I don't agree with all of them, but I like some of them or some aspects of some of them. Um, I, you know, this used to be kind of a Republican talking point, but I've always liked the laboratory of democracy concept where, you know, if it's a, if it's something as difficult and subtle as privacy, maybe we should experiment. Maybe various states should try different things and kind of see what works and what doesn't work. So I'm in favor of that. I also, you know, a quarter of the states have privacy in their constitution, their state constitution, and federal government does have the right to overrule that. But I, I think that's something you need to think very, very carefully about. If it's something important enough that it's in the state constitution, we need to think twice about uh, overruling that. Um, I would also point out there are several different sort of flavors of preemption. So, um, you know, floor preemption just means don't make any don't make any law weaker than ours. Go ahead and make it stronger if you want. Um, um, so, uh, so you know, there's some flavor of preemption that'll do the job. And then um, I'm getting the high sign over there, so <laughs> I, I could go all night. I do have one more for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just one more question. I mean, we saw on social media how um, legislation there hasn't moved because of lobbying efforts on the Hill. And I wanted to ask you both how you see that playing out in the conversation around legislating on AI. And how can your bosses kind of prevent the same problem from happening if you agree that it is such a huge issue? Um, I think that, frankly, it's, it needs to be a collaborative effort. I mean, I think that this, in many ways, there is, um, right now, I think it's a decent time for industry and associations to be weighing in because it, in, it is, in, in many ways, it's, it's green pasture. Like, we don't know inherently what the technology is really going to bring to efficiencies within the economy. And I think it's recognizing that, um, you know, I think there's a sense that there is a little bit more risk to it because of how widely it can be applied, whereas the internet initially was kind of this. You know, it's this quirky little thing kids are playing on, and you know maybe maybe you'll buy your clothes online someday. That'll never happen. Um, but I think AI, there's a sense that this is a transformative shift, and I think that is giving a greater sense of gravity to the way people are having their discussions. So I think that's helping all the conversations we've had thus far. Yeah, John. Yeah, it's definitely a factor. Um, you know, I've, I've heard stories from when uh, you know the famous uh, 32 words in Section 230 were written. And, and they amount to, well, we really didn't realize this was such a big deal. Um, and so unfortunately, I think we have you know, passed that stage. So people are aware that this is a big deal. And so you know, all interests are fully activated. Um, you know, there, there, there's a saying I hear a lot, which is um, you know, for every comms staffer on the Hill, there's like 4,000 lobbyists out there or something ridiculous. You know, it's like, so we're outnumbered, we're outgunned. Um, but we can haul people in front of hearings. <laughs> I mean, we have certain powers ourselves. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't feel uh, like lobbyists are calling the shots. Um, they definitely have a seat at the table. Uh, there are definitely a lot of interests. And, and you know, we're not trying to put anybody out of business. We want to know. <laughs> if, if we're proposing something that's not going to work for someone, we want to know about it. Um, but I don't feel like we're being pushed around. All right. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.